Okay, we're live on YouTube. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Power at Work blog. This is a Power at Work blogcast. We're going to be talking about non-compete agreements and worker power. My name is Seth Harris. I'm a senior fellow at Northeastern University's Burns Center for Social Change. I am really lucky to be joined today for our discussion by Elizabeth Wilkins, who's the director of the Office of Policy Planning at the Federal Trade Commission and a former senior White House official. In fact, she was so senior that she had prime real estate in the West Wing while I was across the street in a closet that masqueraded as an office. So Elizabeth, great to have you. Great to see you again. Thanks for having me. And we're also joined by Professor Sanjukta Paul of the University of Michigan Law School. She is very simply one of the very top scholars at the intersection of antitrust, competition, labor, and market governance. Uh, Sanjukta, delighted to have you. Thanks for being here today. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And let me, uh, I want to start with a shameless plug. Sanjukta has a new book coming out in 2023 called Solidarity in the Shadow of Antitrust Labor and the Legal Idea of Competition. Pre-order her book today at a local independent bookstore. Uh, for goodness sakes, don't buy it from a monopolist or a union buster. It defeats the whole purpose of this blogcast. Um, so the impetus for today's blogcast was the Federal Trade Commission's announcement last week that it was proposing a rule that would have the effect of prohibiting employers from including non-compete agreements in their employment contracts. The commission has was urged to take this action by President Biden in a, a competition executive order back in July of 2021. Unions and worker advocates and scholars like Sanjukta have been advocating for a rule like this for many, many years. But this is, let's be honest, the FTC operating in a new space. Uh, we haven't seen anything like this ever before. Uh, the FTC is a competition agency, not a labor agency. It's also an unfair practices uh, agency. So Elizabeth, let me start off the questioning with you. Would you explain the rule to our viewers in brief and tell us why the commission thought it was important and why it's needed? Absolutely, and thanks so much for uh, for having me on today, Seth. Um, so non-competes, um, there are they are exactly what they sound like, and as you said, they um, are terms in an employment agreement that say um, you may not, after you work for me, you may not go work for a competitor or create a comp competing business. Um, that means that workers are um, stuck in their um, in their jobs. If you are Anywhere from a minimum wage security guard up to a journalist, an engineer, if you have a contract provision that says you can't practice your trade for the next two years in the city that you live in, that's a pretty um, significant curtailment of your, your liberty, your kind of um, work opportunities. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, what we find is not only uh, are there serious consequences for that individual, but highly relevant to the idea that, that we proposed a rule here, it turns out that there are serious consequences for the economy. Uh, there are serious wage effects that we find, um, and there are also effects on uh, innovation, business formation, business dynamism, and, and, and ultimately consumers as well. Um, you're right, we are a competition agency. And uh, I think, Honestly, uh, the reason that we are, have been interested and have been for many years in these clauses is right in the name. They are called non-compete agreements. They hamper the ability of uh, workers to sell their labor competitively in a labor market. They hamper, as I said, uh, entrepreneurship, new business formation and entry into product markets. Um, and uh, the 
the development of the evidence over the last 10 or 20 years or so has really borne out the idea, again, that these are not just individual effects, but that these are market and economy-wide effects that um, are exactly the kind of um, both practices and effects that the FTC is concerned with. Give us a sense of scope. How many workers are we talking about? How much money are we talking about? So um, a misperception about non-competes is that they're sort of uh, for the boardroom, right? That this is about high skill, high wage, or C-suite kind of um, employers. Um, and we find that's just not right. There are a lot of estimates. In our proposal, we preliminarily find that it's pretty safe to say about 18% of the American workforce, 30 million Americans, um, have these uh, contracts. Uh, and like I said, all parts of the of the labor market, um, uh, you know, from um, people working at um, sandwich shops to tech workers to um, to the kind of executives that 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 might be kind of uh, your typical case. And Great. in terms of effects, again, it's a proposal, but um, based on the um, economic studies that we that we've that we've looked at. We preliminarily find that we could be talking about 250 to 300 billion dollars in wages for workers per year. That's billion with billion with a B. Billion with a B, exactly. Every year. Um, every year. That's right. So, uh, Sanjukta, let me turn to you. So, I have been going around telling people that the rule that Elizabeth just described is arguably the most important labor regulation of this year maybe of more than one year. Um, and the reason is the scope that Elizabeth was just talking about. One in five workers in the vicinity of $300 billion in additional wages every year, that's 3% of the total wages and salaries in the United States. That's a gigantic amount of money to go into workers' pockets. Um, so that's, that's why I have been telling people that. Uh, am I right that it's, the most important, um, uh, you know, and let me just say, you contrast it with, say, an overtime regulation, which is important, and Labor Department do an overtime regulation. That would affect millions of workers, and there's probably hundreds of millions or maybe even a low number of billions of dollars of wages involved. But this dwarfs that by comparison. So do you think that argument's right? Is this the most important labor regulation we're going to see this year? I don't know that I have an opinion on that, actually. Um, uh, it was, um, it's, I, I think it's incredibly important. So let me just be very, very clear. Um, I'm, I tend to stay away from sort of like uh, suits saying about what's coming. Um, it's just not my, my uh, area. But uh, this is hugely significant. And I think that the labor community should pay attention to how significant this is. I think that the FTC's team of economists has done a great job showing the economic impact. And then it's beyond the wages as well, right? You know, I mean, I think it's it's in the really excellent document that the FTC prepared, um, you know, really explaining, and I, I, I think we're gonna get to this, but also um, the excellent document that was previously put out on the competition rulemaking authority, right? So which I think we're about to talk about that. But um, uh, yeah, so I think that they do a great job showing the impact. It's not just wages, although that's extremely important, um, but it's also uh, if you're being sexually harassed at work, do you have options? If you, you know, for whatever reason you're locked into your workplace, um, you know, I think that this, option of exit is very important to labor power. And I think, you know, we're probably later on going to talk a little bit about some other relationships between labor and anti-monopoly. But I think that unions, of course, are extremely important as well because of the voice element, the, um, you know, the participation in governance. That's absolutely important. But I don't think we should see these as conflicting, but as reinforcing. Because if the power to exit is strengthened, first of all, it's just the right thing to do, right? Um, it's, you know, I, I've seen some arguments. Uh, I was not on Twitter as much at the time, but that this is, this is, this is uh, crazy because it's, you know, substantively overruling, you know, hundreds of years of 
law. I don't agree with that. I mean, it is so it is changing the law now in a number of states, not all states, as we know, California, etc. There's precedent for it. But actually, this goes back actually to the to the deep roots of the restraint of trade doctrine at common law, which was not actually about price fixing. So the earliest restraint of trade class, uh, cases that we find, you know, old, 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 like 1600s, 1700s, uh, are really focused on non-competes and then on certain other things, the marketing offenses, which are also not price fixing. So, you know, I've heard the argument that, well, but it wasn't a per se rule, but there were no per se rules at common law at that time. It was all rule of reasons. That's what the restraint of trade doctrine was. So I don't think that that's a fair argument. Um, so in any case, deep roots in our legal tradition, huge economic impact, um, important, I think, for reinforcing union power. And also, if workers are just generally more secure and less locked in, they're more able to make empowered decisions to do things like join unions to organize, um, I think, than otherwise. So I don't think we should also see these as conflicting goals. I, I, that's such an important point. Um, the power to quit, what you called exit, um, the power to quit is being exercised by about 4 million workers a month in the United States. And that's been going on for close to 18 months. And that's one of the reasons why wages yeah. are rising at the rapid rate that they are rising right now, is that if workers don't like their job, if their job has low job quality, they can quit. Or if they can, or, you know, in some cases, this doesn't happen very often, they can bargain with their employer and say, I'll stay, but you got to bump me up. You got to move me into this job. You got to promote me. You've got to give me something. And unions provide voice in the workplace, but where there is no union, and sadly, that's the case for the overwhelming majority of American workers, quitting is one of the few pieces of yes. power that they have available to them. Absolutely. And so I think that's, you know, absolutely right. And so therefore, it's the right thing to do anyway. But I also think we've seen in, you know, at, at this recent period that you're talking about new opportunities for organizing arising precisely ironically around these quits. So I don't I don't think we should, these are in conflict either. Great. That's terrific. OK, so if you listen closely from where I'm sitting right now, I'm just outside Washington, D.C. Elizabeth is uh, works in Washington, D.C. St. Jukta is in, in Ann Arbor. Uh, or thereabouts. If you, but if you listen really closely, you can hear the very expensive law firms putting together their appeals to the business trade associations to bring the lawsuit to challenge this regulation that hasn't been, even been promulgated yet. So uh, let me ask a question, Elizabeth, I'll start with you. You'll you'll say what you feel like you can say here, and then I'll ask and Jukka to answer the same question. Um, like I said, we've never seen anything like this before. Does the FTC have the authority to issue a rule like that, to promulgate a rule like that. Um, so first of all, I want to take the begin the preamble to your question before I take your your actual question, just on business interests looking to challenge the rule. Um, I will just point out there's a lot of businesses out there that are quite excited about this. Uh, the um, the the response that we got from the tech community, from uh, the entrepreneurship community, from the small business community is oh man, thank goodness, this is going to help us find the workers that we need. Uh, it's not just workers who want to find the best fit for wages, for their health benefits, for the schedule flexibility that's going to work for their family. It's also uh, employers who want uh, trained, skilled, happy workers who have matched with the right job. Um, and uh, it's not just workers who are hurt when they can't um, can't move. It's also a new entrant into a market who can't uh, who can't enter a market because they can't find the right workers. Um, so we've actually had kind of a tremendous uh, um, response from uh, certain parts of the business community, certain parts of the venture capitalist community, who see this as a real driver of, like I said, business dynamism, entrepreneurship, um, new entry into markets, innovation. Um, so. Uh, I, I think, you know, again, back to the fact that we're a competition agency, you know, it is, it is, I think really, there's a really compelling case for healthy, that this is a, a um, an important element for a healthy competition in the product markets as well. Um, on our authority, we feel as though we have pretty clear authority in the statute to promulgate this kind of a rule. The FTC Act says that we have uh 
authority to promulgate rules pursuant to our uh, ability to go after unfair methods of competition. We have uh, precedent in case law saying that we have that authority. Um, we've done it before. Uh, so uh, we feel good about um, the existence of our authority. And, you know, I'll go a little bit further than that and say uh, Congress wrote this statute. They gave us authority over unfair methods of competition. Here is a situation where we have found a significant amount of evidence of, as we've been talking about, substantial harm in multiple markets. Uh, one of the benefits of rulemaking is that it can have um, market-wide deterrent effect uh, in a way that case-by-case -case enforcement can't. So far from shying away, I think, from the idea of you know, whether or not we have authority here, I would say Congress charged us with this, and it's incredibly important that we take that charge seriously and that where appropriate, as here, for all the factors that I just mentioned, um, we should take our responsibility to use these tools very seriously and to exercise them where appropriate. I think that's why we put this proposal out is because we think that this may be a very appropriate place to use this tool. Great. Uh, Sanjukta, what do you think? Do they have the authority to do it? Yeah, so unsurprisingly, I, I agree, but I will try to add um, a little bit. First of all, I love that framing, is which is that it's not just that the FTC has the authority, but as Elizabeth sort of intimated, actually has the obligation to take up a chart, you know, this charge, this legislative charge. I think that's really important. And so in addition to, I think, and so I recommend to folks who might be wondering about this, the, um, the FTC and Elizabeth's team um, put out you know, an excellent brief essentially on this issue ahead of um, the proposed rulemaking. And in addition to the authorities collected there, the legislative history, the judicial authorities, um, just, you know, the, the careful logical argumentation, I would, I'm just going to add to what I think are two compelling broader reasons that have sort of emerged from the recent like re-theorizing or rethinking of competition law and its foundations. And I think what, so one of those, I think, is this idea that I think pe some people are starting to at least embrace and recognize a growing number of people, hopefully, is that it's not just about more or less competition. It is partly about that, you know, healthy competition, but it's not just that. It's also about competition policy. Competition law is also about channeling competition in certain directions, in certain channels. This is something that institutionalist economists recognized uh, you know, 100 years ago or over 100 years ago, they made this argument. And in fact, you know, famous labor institutionalist argument was that in, you know, when we have a prevailing wage in a market, for example, just conveniently, we can use this example. So this was an argument made by the Webbs, Sidney and Beatrice Webbs, one of the first institutional economists, uh, that th we're not decreasing competition, actually. We're channeling competition. They recognize that there's this is a qualitative determination, not just a quantitative determination. You are channeling competition if you have this you know, prevailing wage standard away from ruinous competition on wages and toward other more pro-social and more economically beneficial things like product innovation and R&D and investing um, on quality. And you know, all there's all these other ways that you can compete, right? When, uh, but you may not have the option to do that if you are forced to compete, you know, to constantly be competing downward on wages, for example. So I know we're not talking about the prevailing wage example here, but that this exactly applies here as well, right? Because by being able to have these oppressive contractual clauses, this is actually a method of competition, um, right? That, that businesses can use to keep potential entrance out, um, as Elizabeth was explaining, um, right? I mean, it, it is, uh, in fact, a method of competition, and the FTC, by by sort of channeling competition away from this sort of uh, antisocial, uh, not economically beneficial method of competition, is thereby channeling it toward um, other more beneficial forms. And I think that Elizabeth explained some of the ways uh, how, but I, I just am emphasizing that I think that this is, um, that this has a basis in, in sort of theorizing markets as well. Um, and then the second, I think, reason or the second sort of, I think, current that really supports this is that we have to look at especially 
once you recognize that this is sort of how markets work, markets always have elements of competition and elements of coordination, and the law and policy are channeling those in particular directions, right? So this isn't going to go away. If the FTC doesn't do it, some other institutional actor is going to make decisions about elements of allowable competition. And do you know who that institutional actor is going to be? It's going to be the courts primarily, right? That's who's primarily doing it now. And I would argue that this issue of the FTC's authority has to be viewed in institutional context that who's actually better equipped to do this and to make these market governance decisions? Is it the FTC with its team of economists and lawyers and others who are doing these market studies who have deeply studied this? Or is it the courts? Is it generalist judges um, who increasingly seem to have an ideological bent of a particular kind as well? Um, and I think that, so I think, I think we can't just look at their authority just in a vacuum, but also um, in comparison. And I think that these two uh, reasons sort of work together. Great. Let me just say, I'm shocked at the suggestion that courts are becoming more ideological. Of, of course, uh, that's not what my constitution says. Um, so let me, let me. I, I, I had a couple more questions I wanted to ask about the rule, but man, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, ground we got to cover here. And I'm so lucky to have both of you here to answer some other questions that I wanted to get into. Uh, so let's, I want to uh, transition, but to a connected uh, issue, and that is enforcement. Um, Elizabeth, the FTC isn't just producing this new proposed regulation. It has begun to take enforcement action. In fact, in the last month, you've announced three enforcement actions, one against a security guard company, to Sanjukta's point about who it is, that, and your point, Elizabeth, about who it is that's covered by these regulations, but also against two glass container manufacturers. Um, and the purpose of that enforcement action was to force those employers to stop using their non-compete clauses in their contracts coercively to keep their employees from quitting their jobs and going to work for others. And again, I think this is the first time that the FTC has sued to halt unlawful non-compete restrictions. So I, I, I got to ask this question. It, it, this is three. Uh, you know, it's, we, we can have the philosophers debate about whether or not three is a trend or whether three bricks make a pile, uh, but whether three enforcement actions make a strategy. But is this the leading edge of a broader enforcement strategy by the FTC relating to non-compete agreements? And if it is, are you going to be targeting employers by, by geography, by industry? Are you going to respond to complaints from workers? Are you going to take complaints from your partner agencies at the National Labor Relations Board and the Labor Department and other labor agencies? What what are what are, are is this the tip of the tip of the iceberg? Is there an iceberg there? That's my question. Well, first, um, if you'll allow me, I want to take a minute to talk about those um, consents that we that we put out because I think they really nicely demonstrate the range of of the problem that we're trying to hit and the solutions here. So you're right. One of the consents that we put out is um, uh, with a security you're company. You're using the word consents, just to clarify. It's a consent decree. <laughs> yes. Why don't you explain that? It's like a settlement agreement. If you're thinking about normal, not normal, it's not like ours isn't normal, but if you're thinking about ordinary kind of litigation parlance, it's like a um, it's like an enforceable, settle, an enforceable settlement agreement, if that makes sense to people. Um, uh, so one of them was against uh, a security guard company with minimum wage security guards. Um, these uh, non-competes prevented security guards from working for two years anywhere within 100 miles of where they worked uh, with any other security company. And they weren't just on paper. This is a company that enforced these non-compete agreements against their security guards. The um, contract provided for $100,000 in damages for mm. minimum wage workers. Um, the company sued workers. The company sued other companies who had hired their workers. So just to think about kind of, you know, when, when our proposal talks about these being coercive and exploitative of the, empower, the power imbalance between workers and employers, I think this is a case that really demonstrates how far that can go. And if you can imagine, you you just can't be a security guard anywhere where you work, where you live, um, if you signed one of these. And and that, you know, to the point about the relationship between exit and voice, uh, 
you know, I can't leave my job. I need a job. I also can't ask for a raise or for better safety conditions or anything. I'm kind of stuck with what I got because I, there's nowhere else to go. I think that that's just a really good example of um, of that that part of of what we're talking about with this rule. And then the glass manufacturers. That's a highly concentrated industry. There were thousands of non-competes uh, locking up almost the entirety of the labor force in mm -hmm. that industry. So if you think about trying to be a new entrant in that um, in that market and trying to find the people with the specialized skills and knowledge to be able to manufacture glass bottles, you might not be able to enter at all. And that's the sort of other side of it. A, you know, you've, you're you're really limiting the options for those workers to practice their trade, but B, you're also limiting competition, innovation, um, price competition, et cetera, on the product side when you're never gonna have a fourth, fifth, sixth glass bottle container uh, maker because there are no workers to be able to, to expand that market. So I'm sorry, you didn't ask that question, but I um, I just think that those two sets of cases really do a nice job of telling the story of of what these look like for workers and for companies and what they work look like all along the income spectrum, which is a large part of why our proposal is doesn't have an income cap, it doesn't have a job cap, it's a full ban, uh, because we think there are serious harms kind of at all parts of the market. As to our plans on um, on enforcement, Seth, as you well know, having been a government official, uh, I will um, be limited in what I want to say about what we are thinking about investigating, et cetera. I will say one of the things that I have always um, been amazed by about the Federal Trade Commission is that we have an enormous, enormous mandate for a very small agency. Um, and so that means that we have to make some really difficult decisions about where to put our enforcement resources. That said, you know, I will say we signed uh, very publicly an MOU with the NLRB this summer. Um, we are constantly in talks with our friends at the Department of Labor to understand what are our different and unique authorities and what's the range of market conduct that we're seeing and how can we work together um, with all of our scarce resources to think about where the greatest harms are and where the greatest deterrent effect is that we can have. And, and, and part of starting a rulemaking is precisely that. How can we pour the resources into a rulemaking upfront to have the greatest amount of impact uh, and deterrence on, on problematic market behavior going forward? Yeah. Uh, that's that's a perfectly fair answer. I know where you couldn't give me any details, but let me just say, I think that those enforcement actions were, um, uh, they were a thunderclap. I think there are a lot of conversations going on in a lot of boardrooms and with a lot of law firms. Uh, maybe we need to rethink things. We didn't think the FTC was going to get into this business. And, and Sanjukta, let me, let me add to that, that this is an area where enforcement has been a meaningful problem. We have a number of states that have limited non-compete agreements. Some states have outright banned non-compete agreements. But in some of those states, employers have continued to use non-compete agreements, almost like an intimidation tactic, so that workers won't quit. Because, you know, workers aren't thumbing through the way that you and I do. They're not thumbing through judicial decisions and codes and regulations to figure out what their rights are and what their rights aren't. They have things to do, and they have jobs to do, and they have families to take care of. So, um, tell me a little bit about enforcement in this space. And in particular, is there something that workers who find themselves subject to these non-compete agreements can do? Do they have any recourse? Whoops, you're on mute. Yeah. Under existing law, do you mean? Or yeah. Because I right because now. I think the point has been made quite convincingly, and I would agree that there isn't that much recourse, actually. Um, in And this is a wide problem. I mean, I, prior to becoming an academic, I uh, represented workers um, for a number of years. And in a slightly different context, uh, not non-competes, but it's exactly the same principle that you're talking about. Um, you know, in one case I worked on, uh, workers were uh, compelled on pain of losing their jobs to sign agreements that purported to waive all their rights in the class action that we had just brought, right? And so this obviously, as you can imagine, freaked out everybody. Um, and 
in the end, I don't, I doubt this agreement would have been enforceable, but there are people who effectively, you know, were constructively fired over it, um, others that signed it uh, and therefore stopped participating in the lawsuit. We tried to get a preliminary injunction from the judge who was sympathetic to our position, but didn't feel that he was in a position to actually issue a preliminary injunction against um, against actually disseminating those contracts. And I think that when you look at that fine grained type of situation. I mean, that's what it would take, right? To, to prevent this practice from actually occurring. And I, um, I, I just, I don't think that the civil litigation system in most states, as I have experienced it, even for contracts that are um, clearly illegal has sort of like the, capa the capacity or just like the, the institutional knowledge to deal with it in this proactive way, which is exactly why I think that this type of proactive rule is so important. You don't need to go get an injunction, right? I mean, this is already prohibited. So, um, and I, of course, the FTC makes that point in their, um, in, in the proposed rulemaking. Good. Very good. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that clarification, that answer. Um, I want to make another turn because there's a lot to talk about with competition policy and labor and what the FTC is doing. Um, and uh, let me talk about another thunderclap that came out of uh, the FTC. This is back in September, Elizabeth. Um, you know it well. My guess is that you uh, were involved in drafting it. The, the FTC issued a policy statement declaring that it would use its full authority to protect the drivers, shoppers, cleaners, care workers, designers, freelancers, and other workers in the so-called gig economy, I don't love that phrase, but in the gig economy, from unfair, deceptive, and anti-competitive practices. Now, as you know, one of the big issues in uh, the online platform economy, another way of looking at it, uh, is worker classification or worker misclassification, maybe is a better way of talking about it. And that is the argument that workers who are engaged in that list of jobs and many others that I didn't list are being treated as independent contractors, but in fact, they're employees. Uh, and as a consequence of being classified as independent contractors rather than employees, they're deprived of a whole long list of legal benefits and protections, minimum wage, overtime, safety and health protection, anti-discrimination protection, the list goes on and on and on. And there are also tax implications for those workers. So Elizabeth, is that one of the unfair deceptive practices that the FTC had in mind when it issued its policy statement? And where do you think you're going to take that policy statement and your enforcement actions going forward? So I'll give the same Disclaimer that I'm not going to talk about any sort of specific um, investigations that we have going, but, you can't, but let me you can't blame a guy for trying. I can't blame a guy for trying. But let me step back for a moment and, and talk a little bit about how 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 we thought about um, this in our policy statement, which gives a sense of how we're thinking about our investigative um, priorities. You're you're exactly right. In there are circumstances where employers are treating what probably should be employees like independent contractors. And, you know, they do this for a whole host of reasons. This is a way to limit liability. It's a way to limit costs, all kinds of things. We have one set of tools that says, oh, I see. These are not employees. These are independent contractors. They're kind of like small businesses. Okay. There are a number of regulations that apply to that circumstance that are also costs. And so if you're going to say that this is the way that our business model works, we'll hold you to it. Are you complying with our business opportunity rule and being very clear about what, um, what uh, drivers are going to earn? Are you complying with all of the kind of disclosure requirements you have on pay? Are you, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you're going to say that this is really your business model, then do it right. And doing it right is probably more costly than you had imagined, and we will hold you to it. So that's not a direct answer to the, to the are these employees classified or not, but it is an answer to, hey, just because you have a new market structure and a new business model that 
you have decided is a kind of um, useful, cost-effective way for you to compete doesn't mean that you can get away with everything. We're going to make sure to hold you to this um, because that's kind of you know what our lane is and what we can do. That's primarily on the con consumer protection side. I should say one of the unique things about the FTC is that we have both antitrust and consumer protection authorities. And, and uh, I think one of the important ways that we think about our authorities is to say not, is this a consumer protection problem or an antitrust problem? We say, what is this market structure? What are the practices that are going on in this market? Are they characterized by some level of abuse of power? Of, um, of extractive practices by a middleman? Um, uh, and if so, what are the array of tools that we have and how might we bring them to bear? And so again, what we see, I think, in some of these like platform economy companies is this might not be a consumer protection problem or an antitrust problem, it's a problem. There is a market structure here that's extractive. There is uh, an imbalance of power between a powerful market actor and smaller ones. Um, what, what are the relevant authorities that we have here to do something about this? On the unfair methods of competition side, you know, there might be a number of things. I saw um, a, an article recently about um, multi-homing apps, apps that allow drivers, for example, to figure out how to switch between platforms and whether or not there are um, you know, concerns about how the platforms treat those apps um, based on the, the power they have. If, you know, if there are circumstances where a platform is using its market power to unfairly either disadvantage other market participants or disadvantage competitors in a way that impacts the, market, the, the labor market, then that's something that we are going to be interested in. That's absolutely fascinating. Centripta, let me, uh, I, I want to tie together your, your combined areas of expertise. As you know very well, uh, the General Counsel of the National Labor Relations Board, Jennifer Brusso, in an advice memo or a public memorandum, uh, offered the legal view of the General Counsel's office to the NLRB that employers telling workers who are employees that they are independent contractors, misclassifying them, yeah. is, is a violation of the act. Yeah. Right. And it's a violation of the act because it's essentially saying to the workers, all of those protections that employees get under the National Labor Relations Act, you know, the right to engage in protected concerted activity that, you know, protections against retaliation, all those a long list protections they get. You don't get those worker because you're an independent contractor. And that, therefore, is a violation of the act. Is for similar reasons. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> I was well, just going to say. Uh, uh, your your answer is going to be better than my question. No, no, go, no, ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just I, all I was, I was going to interject that for similar reasons that you're that you were pointing out well, um, about non competes. Ex yeah. Explain that to us. Why is that, that? There's a chilling effect, right? Like if you are if there's like an employer telling workers who, as you said, you know, don't have the benefit of legal counsel, don't have the benefit of like loads of time to like look all the stuff. I've been talking about this all day on webinars, like we are. Um, uh, that there is a strong chilling effect then on the rights that they actually exercise. That, that's all I was going to say. And so I think no, that I, is a very powerful uh, step by the NLRB. Yeah. So is it the question I was going to ask, although that was a better, you gave a better answer than this question it justifies. And that is, um, is that also a violation of antitrust law, of unfair competition law to tell workers who are employees that they're independent contractors? Or is that uh, too hard a question to answer in this sort of vague hypothetical. I'm going to answer around your question, uh, if I may. <laughs> um, so first of all, I actually want to pick up on what Elizabeth was saying, um, both in terms of the Consumer Protection Authority and then also in terms of the Competition Authority. I think it's extremely important um, to sort of go at this from both directions. And I think that we shouldn't sort of take the attitude strategically that um, that it somehow um, is a betrayal of the cause of, you know, of, of sort of seeing uh, right done on uh, by misclassified employees to, to, you know, to actually use all of these forms of authority, because as Elizabeth pointed out, there are costs um, that they're currently managing to avoid. They're managing to avoid the costs. Um, really, they're not just costs, right? They're like, 
it, it's a either way, it's a social bargain that you make with society. You're getting certain benefits from the law and that you that you're get privileges that you're getting to exercise as a business and that there's a social bargain in, involved. And that these gray, you know, the gray area that many of these companies, uh, platform labor companies are occupying at the moment, basically they're evading both sets of social bargains, right? So I think it's important to uh, enforcement wise for the agencies that have the jurisdiction to seek to enforce both social bargains um, and then let the ships fall where they may really, because um, I don't think we have to try to control the outcome even. Um, and, and then more specifically, really quickly, just to expand on what Elizabeth said super briefly, um, under the unfair competition um, uh, uh, side of things, uh, as opposed to the consumer protection side, there are, you know, all kinds of controls that these companies, these platforms or companies put um, on workers and on workers dealings with their putative customers, which is what they are supposed to be, according to this business model that they're claiming, that would not be permitted just under even sort of um, well, I don't want to overclaim here, I was going to say textbook antitrust law, but certainly they're dictating prices and they're engaged, you know, they're engaging mm. in price coordination across a market in a way that if the drivers themselves were to do it would be probably considered a price fixing violation, right? And so they're, so they're evading that, getting the benefit of that, but then not really sharing the benefit of that with workers, usually in, in these labor platform situations. And so this is another sort of like making them choose. Also, um, Elizabeth referred referred to essentially exclusive dealing or constructive exclusive dealing by either banning the multi-homing apps or by employing non-linear pay, pay uh, mechanisms that basically prevent uh, drivers from switching between apps essentially a form of constructive exclusive dealing, um, this is also anti-competitive, right? So again, you either need to like allow this, you know, uh, allow this to be at least a somewhat truly competitive market or um, you need to fulfill this other social bargain. On so back to your question, I, mean, I do think that the FTC, I think that this is um, not, I, I will know that I would frame it in terms of it's a violation of antitrust law. I think you could certainly argue that misclassification is unfair competition. Absolutely, theoretically, right? But I think that there's actually also potentially power that the FTC has to actually adopt its own test for employment, slightly a different issue, because mm. the labor exemption to antitrust law is something that, the, you know, when it, this is partly judge made law that comes out of the end of the New Deal. And there's kind of shared jurist. I mean, you know, the NLR, the labor laws get a say, the antitrust law gets a say. FTC does have a definite, you know, I don't think they've propounded sort of in general terms um, a definition of employment, but in the franchise rule, there is a definition of um, employment. And I believe that they, it currently, and this, is, this is from like decades ago, and I think it's still there, right? Um, I believe it's currently the common law test, I think. But the FTC could revise that. And I think it could actually go further and say that we're adopting, you know, not for the purposes of the labor laws, but for the purposes of the labor exemption, which is really something that there's, I think, joint jurisdiction of. I want you to I mm -hmm. want you to explain what you mean by the labor exemption for the for the people who oh, are not sorry. necessarily read in on yes, it. Yes, sorry. So so um, this is sort of at the junction of you know labor and antitrust law, and and says that. Um, uh, labor unions and worker concerted activity in general enjoys an exemption from antitrust law, uh, just like there are numerous other exemptions for agricultural co-ops, for, you know, lots of business firms themselves, importantly, enjoy an exemption from antitrust law by doing business in a, uh, uh, in a multi-plant or multi-employee context. And uh, labor unions also have a qualified exemption from antitrust law. Right. And so, reinterpreting that exemption to expand not to just to labor unions but also to include workers more broadly so what right? what i was actually suggesting is you don't even have to change the terms of the law at all just that that, that the ftc i think has you know, could simply say that we're, instead of adopting the common law test, we're adopting the ABC test. Um, I think that that's something that FTC could do. I mean, they currently have adopted a different test, it, you know, the common law test uh, in the context of the franchise rule in this, you know, dusty old um, hmm. context. But but I think, I, I, I think that that would be an interesting area to, to see uh, what might be possible. The, the ABC test being arguably the broadest definition of employee in the law 
and therefore including many, many, many more workers just for classification purposes as employees, which would have meaningful effects in a number of different areas if we were to do it. And this is a big part of the fight over labor law reform, reform of other laws. It's part of the big battle that's going on in California right now about Prop 22, which is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the gig companies. Um, effort to to keep a, the ABC test from applying. That's that's what the fight is. Just wanted to give a further explanation of that. Okay, well, I had more to talk about, but th there was so much to say on these topics. This is a, an extremely rich and important area of the law, and the FTC is is taking extremely important action in this area, and I thought it was important that we get it out there, have a couple of experts come on and explain it to us. So I'm going to have to, what I'm saying is, I'm going to have to invite you back so that we can continue this very important conversation about the intersection of of labor issues broadly, unions in particular, antitrust, competition law, and market governance. Um, but I want to. We, we have to close. Uh, we're at the end of our time, so I I I, I want to say I told you so. I knew that forty five minutes wasn't going to be enough. Um, but I want to thank Elizabeth Wilkins and Professor Sanjuk to Paul for joining us on this Power at Work blogcast. I also want to thank our producer, uh, both producer and technical producer, Lexi Anderson. And I want to thank all of you for watching with us on this Friday afternoon or whenever you're watching this, hopefully Saturday morning, Sunday evening, whenever you get to it. While you are here on the Power at Work blog, subscribe so we can keep you updated about important events like this one. Watch this space. We're going to have another blogcast coming up this week, probably on Thursday, to talk about the new BLS release of the union members survey. Uh, tell us what the union density rate was, how many union members there were in 2022. So watch this space, come on back and see what we have to say there. So thanks again to everyone. We look forward to having you back here again soon. Thanks.